And to follow on from that, and in ECG land, we're going to stay there, um, Professor Martin Uganda, ex-Karolinska unit in, uh, in Sweden, and now at the University of Sydney, a professor of clinical imaging, is going to take us through the future role of ECG. Thanks, Martin. Thank you. Do we want to do a standing in place, five seconds stand up and uh, sit down after that? I'll give you five, four, three, two, one. Welcome back. Welcome back to the next session. So uh, we're going to talk about the future potential of the electrocardiogram. Uh, I'm a cardiac MRI guy, and the ECG people came to me and said, hey, we want to figure out, can we quantify the amount of scar with ECG? Can we, how can we do that? Can we use MRI as the ground truth? And this is about 20 years ago, so I got wrapped up into the ECG world and it hasn't quite left me. Uh, as a disclosure, I'm a founder of the Advanced ECG Systems, which commercializes some of our, our research findings, but I'm a full-time academic. So what I'm going to talk about today is, firstly, or it's the future of the electrocardiogram. Not what we have today, but, or not what we had yesterday, but what we have today and looking into the future. And the, the, it can be summarized in three things. One is the normal looking ECG. The normal looking ECG has lots of powerful information using AI or advanced ECG uh, methods, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the differences there. Uh, the secondly is a consumer self-screening. We have all these devices, and now we can even get, using a smartwatch and, an I, uh, and, and their smartphone, a 12 lead ECG, a standard 12 lead ECG just using your existing Apple Watch, for example. We'll talk about that. Uh, and then big data uh, and the initiative for electrocardiography Australia, or Electra. I'll mention that a little bit. So starting off with the normal ECG, normal looking ECG. So bread and butter, we've all been there in our medical training, in our cardiology training, in our everyday clinics. We use the electrocardiogram to diagnose arrhythmias in people with uh, symptomatic palpitations, uh, even sub, sub pre-symptomatic people, and we can uh, identify ST deviation in the acute coronary syndrome and chest pain situation. So neither of that is, is new. It's a conventional ECG interpretation. It's a yes, no question that we have criteria for. They're not perfect, but they're, they're pretty darn good. And that's sort of below the line. Above the line is what is new. And that is the normal looking ECG in the patient that is not necessarily symptomatic. And it's using AI or advanced ECG techniques. And it's giving us, instead of a yes, no answer, it's giving us a continuous scale, a, a probability between zero and 100%. And we're finding all kinds of things that we don't normally look for or have been able to find with the electrocardiogram, namely ejection fraction by 12 lead resting ECG, diastolic dysfunction, identifying atrial fibrillation in someone who is in sinus, long QT syndrome despite a normal QTC, coronary artery disease or microvascular disease, left ventricular hypertrophy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, ischemic cardiomyopathy, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, as well as amyloid pulmonary hypertension, coronary artery calcification by CT by ECG. And then lastly, the electrocardiographic heart age, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about. This is all stuff that we don't normally look to the ECG to find, and we now have the ability to see with the electrocardiogram using different techniques. And to address a little bit the AI ECG as opposed to the advanced ECG, those are terms that we use to describe things, but the, in the AI world, the artificial intelligence ECG, we have a black box. We have neural network technology, where something is doing something and identifying something in the signals, and then it says a number. The, the likelihood is 93% likelihood of having ejection fraction less than 50%, or 93, no, uh, 80, uh, 12, 2 likelihood of being healthy. So they, there's gotta be something wrong. But we don't know why, and that is very frustrating for me as an individual, and many of uh, our colleagues and our clinical uh, collaborators uh, alike. Advanced ECG, by, by, in, in, uh, in contrast, is a transparent box. You get to see and know exactly what electrocardiographic measures are contributing to a, a given score, and they're all very well-known, well-defined, and uh, have, uh, have all been published before independently, but are in some kind of multivariable score. We'll talk about that. These are different approaches, and 
You may have a particular uh, preference, uh, but um, my, my bet for the future is that it's preferable to have something explainable and transparent rather than black, uh, a black box approach. We could talk more about that. So what is advanced ECG analysis in the transparent box? Well, it's using the standard resting 12 bit ECG from your standard ECG machine. So it's nothing about acquiring the ECG differently. It's just about analyzing it differently. And with a digital ECG raw data file, you can extract in principle, three different types of things. One, you can extract conventional parameters, the durations and amplitudes that we all know and are familiar with. Secondly, we can use the 12 bit ECG to derive a vector cardiogram. We derive the X, Y, and Z leads of the vector cardiogram, which allows us to quantify and put a number to all that in the vector cardiographic literature from the 1950s and 60s, where all, when many of that, much of that work was done, and which all have a lot of diagnostic uh, uh, contribution and, and diagnostic, diagnostic discriminatory power. Thirdly, we can measure something called waveform complexity. And that, that's obviously a word, but uh, it, it has behind it a history coming from signal analysis world. And it's not just signals of electrocardiography, waveform complexity analysis using methods such as singular value decomposition that's used for radio astronomy signals to like, look at how complex is the signal. Let's just accept for a moment that we can put a number to the complexity of, a, of an electrocardiogram by converting it to eigenvector leads, which is a new word. I'll just leave it there for a moment. In a, in a 12 bit ECG, we get eight eigenvector leads, which give us information uh, that also has been published uh, one, one, me one measure at a time extensively in the literature. When we put these three things together, the conventional parameters, derived vector cardiographic parameters, and the waveform complexity parameters, we get about 500 measures off a given ECG. And using databases of about 10, 000, uh, in excess of 10,000 patients with known disease and or health, we can derive and have derived and published a number of advanced ECG scores. And these are derived using multivariable statistical analyses, such as multivariable logistic regression or linear discriminant analysis. These are statistical me methods where we have many measures and see which ones in combination can give us a good um, uh, a good feel for the ability to discriminate between health and disease. So what are examples of this? For example, we have a left ventricular systolic dysfunction score. It gives us a probability between zero and 100% of having an ejection fraction less than 50%. The transparent bit about the AECG approach as opposed to the AI ECG approach is that we know exactly what measures are going into this. And we will, for a given ECG, know the, the normal ranges and we know the numbers coming off of that. And the AECG score for LVSD is a five parameter score. It includes the 12 lead voltage. That's something we can inherently understand that, that we do conventionally. But then it includes a vector cardiographic measure, the integral of the Z lead or the Z lead. Uh, it also includes a vector cardiographic measure that is the mean QRS T angle, the angle in three dimensional space between the direction of the QRS loop and the T loop. Equally, it has two waveform complexity measures from singular value decomposition. The sum of the QRS amplitudes in eigenvector leads four through eight, and the sum of the T amplitudes in eigenvector leads one through three. These uh, measures in combination give us an excellent diagnostic performance for identifying ejection fraction less than 50%. Sensitivity of 83, 93, uh, specificity 93, positive predictive value 92%, negative predictive value 85%, and a positive likelihood ratio of 12 and an inverse negative likelihood ratio of six. So likelihood ratios is how many more times likely is it that someone has this if we have a positive outcome of the score? Well, th those are generally considered uh, very decent uh, likelihood ratios. And it's an independent, uh, it's a measure that's independent of the prevalence of disease in the given population. So we can, for a given uh, uh, ECG, we can just say whether or not they have eject, an ejection fraction less than, less than 50% on a probability scale. But then we can go on to discriminant scores. And this is a, obviously a, 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 a illegible slide with 39 different measures, but each measure is known. And these measures together can give us a, the ability to discriminate between numerous disease states. Here we have the, the disease states on the right. In this case, someone who had a 99% likelihood of having coronary artery disease and or 
microvascular disease, but a less than 1% likelihood of having ischemic cardiomyopathy, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, left ventricular electrical remodeling or, hyper, or hypertrophy, ion channelopathy, or being healthy. So th this is something that uh, we published recently uh, in Europace, and using these 39 measures in combination, it's sort of a multi uh, dimensional um, classification, the sum of the scores will add up to 100%. So it gives them which of these states is the most likely one. And that indeed has a, an excellent diagnostic performance. Here we have for those individual different disease states on the far right, the area under the curves in the high, 90, in the high 90s, positive likelihood ratios uh, that are uh, several fold higher than 10, <laughs> very high, and even the inverse likelihood ratios are, are high. So the ability to, um, to diagnose, to identify, and to rule out diseases that we normally don't at all associate with the ability to identify using electrocardiogram can be done with advanced ECG analysis of the conventionally acquired standard resting 12 lead ECG. So how about heart age? We talked about that. That's a, a slightly different word. So we know that we can electrocardiographically estimate the age of the heart from the ECG. And this has been done using a number of AI techniques, but it can also be done using the tr more, somewhat more transparent advanced ECG techniques. And interestingly, when we use the advanced ECG as a composed to all the other uh, AI-based approaches, we trained it only using exclusively healthy individuals. So the advanced ECG heart age gap, which is the difference between the heart age electrocardiographically and the chronological age in the individual, should be zero for healthy individuals. And indeed, we have that. So someone who has a heart age gap, uh, a heart age of, uh, I, I myself, I, I'm 49, so if I had a, uh, an ECG heart age of 49, my gap would be zero. If my ECG heart age was 59, my gap would be 10. And in fact, we see that people who have cardiovascular risk factors have on average a seven year gap. People who have manifest diagnosis of cardiovascular disease have a gap of approaching 14 years. So this is something that differentiates and identifies early stages of disease, and it's related to this age measure, which is in a weird way something that is incredibly powerful for the patient. Patients come in and they say, I don't want to hear about this ejection fraction bullshit. I don't understand that you know, 50% is normal, it should be 100%. Don't tell me millimoles and per microliter, and don't tell me about millimeters of mercury, but tell me my heart age. That's what I want to know, doc. Tell me my heart age. Because every single person has this intuitive relationship to age from the earliest of, uh, age in childhood. You know exactly how old you are, how old everybody else is, and who's older, who's younger. And this age is incredibly powerful. In fact, it is also powerful for looking at events. So on the right-hand side, we see the hazard ratio for, for um, hospitalization for heart failure or death, which increases uh, continuously with an increasing heart age gap. More importantly, it also works a lot better than the AI approaches that have not trained exclusively on healthy individuals. So on the left-hand side, we see the heart age gap. The higher it is, the worse the outcomes. Again, event-free survival, uh, from heart hospitalization for heart failure or death. On the right-hand side, in that same population, on those same ECGs, using a deep neural network AI ECG approach is not able to tease out those things. So even when we take the step to, to explainable advanced ECG methods, we also don't sacrifice accuracy. Actually, we're better than the AI approaches, in, at least in this approach. So that was looking at the normal looking ECG, let's take a step into the consumer self-screening space and the smartwatch 12 lead ECG. What you say, 12 lead ECG using a smartwatch? It's just a single lead device, how can we do that? Well, we've developed this technology uh, uh, and are commercializing it as well, but we're using it in scientific studies in particular. Uh, you do 30 seconds of recording with your Apple Watch when you do a recording. You can only do that. Apple doesn't let you change the dura duration of recording. But you can take the watch off your wrist and you can move it around to the precordial lead positions. And if you do that from 15 different locations, basically lead one, two, and three from the extremities, and the chest leads, you have to do once with the right arm, once with the left arm. You can not estimate, but actually calculate, and we do this uh, with validated accuracy, the true standard 12 lead ECG. So it's not guessing what a V1 would look like, it's actual V1, the 
uh, potential between the V1 sticker and the Wilson Central Terminal, which we're able to do by a little bit smart alignment of the average beats. So the total recording time, it's not, in, it's not momentaneous, it's not instantaneous. You have to do 15, 30 second recordings, so it's seven and a half minutes of recording, but it has validated accuracy versus the conventional 12 ECG, and the outcome looks something like this. Uh, this is uh, on myself, taken a couple, uh, couple weeks ago. Uh, it gives you the average beat of the standard 12 leads, and then, of course, a rhythm strip. We have rhythm strips for all 15 lead recordings for 30 seconds, so that's a, a mini halter in itself. But importantly, we get the true leads, and these leads can then go into advanced ECG analysis. And that makes it a little bit interesting. Again, you just, they don't, people don't need any extra hardware. They just need an app and their existing uh, Apple Watch and an and iPhone. So that brings us to the HeartWatch study, which is being led by a cardiologist and a PhD student, Zaidan Al-Falahi, in our group. And the HeartWatch study, uh, funded by uh, money initially coming from the MRFF, is an Australian consumer self-screening study using Apple Watch 12 lead ECG analyzed with advanced ECG analysis, where we've gotten uh, ethical approval and are uh, have an uh, impending launch shortly. Of the roughly 2.5 million Apple Watch users in Australia in 2020, there are more now, we are going to be recruiting and asking 30,000 Australians aged 20 to 80 years old uh, in cohorts of 2,500 individuals per sex and decade of life that do not know that they have heart disease already. To, we're going to ask them to electronically consent and provide clinical data at baseline, record their 12 lead ECG using themselves, uh, by, uh, by themselves, and send all those ECGs to us, and they will be analyzed by a cardiac technician with overread by a cardiologist as needed. They will get a referral to their GP if a major pathology is detected using conventional ECG assessment, so a barn door hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, long QT syndrome, et cetera. But the primary outcome of the study is to follow them for two years and use our advanced ECG coronary artery disease score to predict MACE at two years. So hopefully, fingers crossed, there's lots of uh, uh, I's, to, I's to dot and, and T's to cross, but if we can show a relationship between advanced ECG analysis of the consumer self-acquired 12 at ECG, then we can potentially do intervention studies where we're screening and then randomizing to, to early primary intervention. And ultimately, we'd, we'd love to be able to, to reduce uh, cardiac death, which is the ultimate goal. But consumer self-screening is the, the, the trend. Um, also, when it comes to, to, to this 12 ECG, I can today acquire this with my watch on my iPhone here. So if anyone wants to and has seven and a half minutes free at the, uh, later tonight, we can, uh, we can do it. Uh, might have to shave the chest of those who uh, have hairy chests, but uh, it's uh, certainly a possibility. Finally, uh, big data analysis and the Electrocardiography Australia. I just have one slide about that. Uh, the future of uh, our understanding of clinical relationships is something that uh, d re requires and, and is helpful to have big data. We're starting a national ECG database that we're calling Electra, 12 at ECG raw data linked with outcomes using the National Echocardiography Database Australia platform for linkage. We're meeting up at the Cardiac Society in Perth. Anyone that's interested in, in joining up in that uh, clinical research initiative is welcome to, to reach out. Lastly, in summary, the normal looking ECG can get, and we can get it with AI or advanced ECG. Advanced ECG has the, has the advantage of the transparency. Consumer self-screening is a trend, not only with the single ECG, now we can go take the step to 12 leads, and we're gonna be learning more data about that upcoming. And uh, big data for Electrocardiography Australia to give us uh, the advantage there on uh, insights to clinical relationships. Thank you for your attention.